Every teacher teaching the poem in hand is likely to say at some point or the other that in memoriam A H H is one of the greatest elegies in the English language. Let us for a moment focus critical attention on the term elegy. In a very general sense, elegy is any verse written in a particular meter, any verse written in elegiac couplets. That was how it was to begin with. And I think we can say that the earliest elegies in Western literature are the idols of Theocritus, the Greek poet. He was a Sicilian poet who wrote in Greek in the 3rd century BC. But in a narrow sense, an elegy is a lament for the dead. So, an elegy can be a poem of profound thought, a poem of serious reflection. It can also be a lament for the dead. I think that the earliest elegies in the English language are the are the old English poems, the wanderer and the seafarer. Let us try to identify the most important elegies in the English language. We have Lycidas of Milton, the elegies of John Donne, Elegy written in a country churchyard of Thomas Gray. O Captain, my Captain of Walt Whitman. In memory of W. B. Yeats, of W. H. Auden. Among the tombs of Robert Bridges. This is not a comprehensive list. This is not an exhaustive list. I've just mentioned the titles of the elegies that have come to my mind. And there is no doubt that In Memoriam A.H.H. -H stands tall among all these elegies. Canto 31 brings in the story of Lazarus. Lazarus in the Bible, in the New Testament, was the brother of Mary and Martha, ardent disciples of the Lord. Lazarus falls sick and then Lazarus dies. Lazarus is buried and he lies in his tomb for four days. Jesus is informed of the death of Lazarus, but Jesus takes his own time, his own sweet time, four days in fact, to reach the place. Jesus brings Lazarus back to life. The poet's point is that the poet's point is whether during those four days when Lazarus was in his tomb, did he decide to hear his sister Mary weep for him? Did Mary ask Lazarus what happened during those four days? 
these questions are not answered if at all such interactions are taken place they are not spoken of by the evangelist all that the evangelist says is that Lazarus died Lazarus was buried Lazarus was brought back to life by Jesus and the event was celebrated widely by the people there we do not have any more information the evangelist that Tennyson refers to is of course John I think it's only in the Gospel of John that we have the story and we have it in John 11 1 to 44 the canto reveals that Tennyson was a keen student of the Bible he loved the Bible very much he loved the language of the Bible which he tried to imbibe and he very frequently returned to the Bible for solace for comfort for consolation Canto 22 continues the Lazarus story after he was raised from the dead Lazarus attended a dinner at the house of Simon the leper in which his sister Mary served Jesus the poet imagines the situation there Lazarus the dead man brought back to life Jesus the Savior Mary the sister of Lazarus and the ardent follower of Jesus the poet says that Mary was overwhelmed overwhelmed by a sense of love she looks at Lazarus and then she looks at the Lord and she is overwhelmed by a sense of love subtle thoughts complex doubts penetrating questions about life after life about death are all replaced by devotion by joy by love as Mary washes the feet of Jesus with aromatic oil and with tears the poet concludes that they are blessed who offer faithful prayers who experience higher love and certainly those who possess souls so pure as the soul of Mary have such experiences Canto 33 works out a contrast between pantheism and the core beliefs of Christianity the pantheist has a faith whose center is everywhere the pantheist finds God in everything in everything around him the pantheist refuses to link God to one particular form the poet wants the pantheist to leave pious women alone the pious woman prays to a personal God she is happy in her belief let her enjoy her happiness the pantheist should not 
disturb the pious woman who links the divine truth to the flesh and blood of Jesus. The pantheist lives in his own world. Let him do so. While the pious woman lives in her own world, let her do so. The poet seems to advocate a live and let live policy for at the closure of the canto the poet says that the pantheist does not fail in a world of sin even though the pantheist does not believe in Jesus Christ. The poet here adopts a typically Victorian attitude. He tries to emphasize and glorify the core beliefs of Christianity. But he refuses to do so in a rigid manner. He refuses to declare that everything outside the beliefs of Christianity is sinful. Christianity was the most important religion, the dominant religion of the Victorian world. But the Victorian world did not fail to ask questions, did not fail to raise doubts regarding Christianity and its core values and its core beliefs. And in general, the Victorians admitted that there is more than one way to the ultimate truth and that the best approach in such matters would be the policy of live and let live. The word pantheism brings to the mind of the student of English language and literature the name Wordsworth, William Wordsworth. Wordsworth was a pantheist, at least in certain points of his life. But I would like to go further and claim that he was not merely a pantheist, but also an Advaita Vedanti. In the, init in the initial phase of his career as a poet, and this is precisely my argument in one of the papers I published some decades back. Perhaps the most remarkable delineation of pantheism in English poetry is the passage in Tindanami lines beginning with the words and I have felt. Let me try to remember the lines. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime, or something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and the round ocean, and the living air, and the blue sky, and in the mind of man. Unquote. Tennyson was a systematic and diligent student of English poetry. And I think that we can easily presume 
an intrinsic connection between the discussion of pantheism in the canto in hand and Tennyson's study of Wordsworth's poetry. Canto 34 continues the discussion initiated in Canto 33. The poet says that his life has taught him that only the spiritual life is significant. Everything other than the soul, everything other than the spiritual life is temporary and will ultimately turn to dust, will ultimately become nothing. If one exists without a conscience, without a moral aim, one would be unable to find meaning in this world, even God would be meaningless. And the poet does not desire to live in such a meaningless world. It would be better to cease to exist as quickly as possible. If the world were such, if the world were devoid of meaning, if the world had no spiritual significance. In Canto 35, the poet says that if he comes to know from some voice from the grave that death is the end of life, that death means extinction, that there is no life beyond death, he would try to make his life sweet through love. If there is one thing that can make life sweet, that is love. The poet continues the discussion and towards the end of the canto points out that if death is indeed an extinction, a complete extinction, love would cease to be with death. Love would cease to be love and love would become a mere sensual fellowship, a mere physical fellowship, a mere carnal relationship. In fact, love would cease to have hold cease to hold any spiritual significance, any noble meaning. Canto 36 alludes to Jesus Christ, Son of God and God the Son. The poet expresses his gratitude to Christ, to Jesus, for conveying great spiritual truths for conveying divine truths through parables. The wisdom of God having to deal with the very limited powers of understanding, powers of comprehension, the very limited intelligence of man decided to convey divine truths in such a language that even the least equipped, intellectually equipped, the least intellectually equipped man could comprehend them. Thus, the teachings of Jesus conveyed to simple but forceful language can be understood by the laborer, by the mason, by the grave digger, 
by even the savage. Canto 37 opens with a classical touch. In fact, adds a classical touch to the work. It brings in Urania, Parnassus and Melpomene. Urania is one of the nine muses of classical mythology. She is the muse of astronomy. She is the muse of the heavens. And later, she came to be seen as the muse of philosophy, even the muse of Christian poetry. Parnassus is a mountain in central Greece where the muses live. And thus, Parnassus is a mythological home of poetry and music. Melpomene literally means one that is melodious. She is also one of the nine muses of classical mythology and uh, ultimately came to be identified as the muse of tragedy. The canto ends with a biblical touch, with a reference to the parable of the vineyard found in Matthew 20, where the owner of a vineyard a vineyard is a grape plantation, invites laborers to work in his plantation. They arrive at different points of the day and the owner of the vineyard pays all of them the same wages. The poet imagines that Urania rebukes him for venturing upon holy ground, for venturing upon ground hallowed by the work of greater poets. It's quite possible that Milton and Dante are in the mind of Tennyson. Urania advises the poet to confine himself to native rill, to small-scale poetry, to haunt the earthly Parnassus as opposed to the heavenly Parnassus. Melpomene comes to the defense of the poet, pointing out that his poetry offers solace to his own aching heart, that his poetry offers comfort by speaking about love and that his poetry is based on truth revealed rather than truth hidden. The truth of classical mythology, the truth of paganism was truth hidden. But the truth of Jesus, the truth of Christianity is truth revealed. And truth revealed is the basis for the work of Tennyson. How do we connect the parable of the vineyard to the thematic strand of the canto? In the parable of the vineyard, all the laborers, the laborers who come early, in the day, the laborers who arrive later and the laborers who arrive in the 11th hour are all paid the same by the master, by the owner of the vineyard. Probably the poet wants to convey the message that though he has come late, though he has arrived late, Though he is a lesser poet than the poets who came before him, because his poetry has as its foundation the revealed truth of the gospel, 
he will be rewarded as much as the poets who came early the poets who proved to be more able than he canto 38 is a short canto of three stanzas the poet says the world has changed beyond recognition the world is no longer what it was when Hallam was alive. Nature is no longer what it was when Hallam was alive. Spring, the spring season does not give the poet any joy. The beauty of nature refuses to ignite in the poet any happiness. The melodies of the birds, the melodies of spring fail to impact the poet in a positive manner as they used to when Hallam was alive. The point is that the world is no longer what it was. Nature is no longer what it was. Spring is no longer what it was when Hallam was alive. But the poet continues to sing his songs because he hopes that, he believes that, he thinks that they will give joy to him about whom the songs are sung. I sing of thee, not all ungrateful to thine ear. The poet's point is that, at least as far as this canto is concerned, he sings because he believes that his songs will make Hallam happy. Canto 39 is the yew tree canto. The second yew tree canto because we had come across the yew tree in canto 2. The first yew tree canto. Here in canto 39 the poet works out the complete identification between the yew tree and himself. The yew tree is experiencing its golden hour. It's, it is in bloom, it is in full bloom. Its flowers are bright yellow, but the flowers are not permanent. When the yew tree is shaken, the pollen falls like dust, and the tree starts resuming its old gloom. Similar is the case of the poet. The spirit, of the, the spirit of the poet may brighten for a moment, but then it returns to its accustomed melancholy. I have already said that Lord Tennyson is a great nature poet, that he rivals William Wordsworth in the matter. And sometimes I feel that Lord Tennyson is a more keen observer of nature than Wordsworth. Look at the yew tree stanzas. How the poet devotes close attention, devotes keen observation to the yew tree how he describes the yew tree in minute detail and how he differentiates between the yew tree in bloom and the yew tree in gloom. I think that many aspects of Tennyson's poetry are analyzed, evaluated by students and teachers. But this aspect of Tennyson's poetry, Tennyson's passion for nature, Tennyson is a nature poet. Tennyson is a keen observer of nature. Tennyson's nature descriptions, which are remarkable for their minute detail, 
these are things which are generally ignored by students and teachers canto 40 demonstrates how like shakespeare tennyson is the master of the homely metaphor tennyson uses a beautiful homely metaphor a very appropriate homely metaphor to capture the crux of the situation Hallam is dead and gone the poet says that it is like a maiden leaving the house of her father and going to the house of her husband after her marriage the poet refuses to believe that there has been an extinction of the life of Hallam. The poet likes to believe that like the maiden marrying and going to her husband's home, Hallam is gone to some better place and that his departure to that place is the beginning of something fruitful however there is a difference the woman who moves from her father's home to her husband's home will return one day to her father's home with a baby in her hands but the poet shall never again meet Hallam there shall never again be a physical meeting between Hallam and Tennyson until Tennyson's life on this earth comes to an end. I would like to conclude by quoting a sentence about Tennyson, about Tennyson's poetry by Stopford Brooke, by Stopford Augustus Brooke. I quote, Every line is alive with his own distinction, unquote. Let me repeat the sentence. Every line is alive with his own distinction, 